Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening in a conversation with Robin Archer, which is part of Proposals for Novel Ways of Being, Circuit Breaker. Circuit Breaker is the first in a series of talks inaugurated by Proposals for Novel Ways of Being, which is a range of exhibitions and programs variously organized by 12 Singapore institutions, art spaces, and collectives that started late 2020 and which will run through February of this year, and broadly in response to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Circuit Breaker Talk series takes its subtitle from Singapore's version of a lockdown to limit the spread of the virus. And so using this metaphor of disruption, we have over the last few months organized a series of talks and roundtables where speakers have been invited to speculate, to unpack, and to polemicize on the opportunity for change in their respective domains and also on the role of museums and cultural institutions given the pandemic. We have had speakers from various fields of thought and practice, from academics to artists to museum and other cultural workers. And some of our past speakers from overseas include theorist and post-colonial scholar Omi Baba in October and forensic architecture just yesterday. You may locate the recordings and information of our past programs on novelwaysofbeing.sg. The pandemic has given us all a chance to step back and re-examine our prevailing practices. What do we want to see changed? What are the learnings we can take with us from this crisis and for humanity as a whole? And how can the arts and festivals play a leading role in this transformation? As we continue to grapple with the impact of the pandemic, we are simultaneously trying to understand what all of this may mean for the future of the arts, festivals, and society. For today, we are very honoured to have Robin Archer speaking to us from Melbourne. You've seen her biography at the beginning slides, so I shall just introduce her briefly here. I would describe Robin Archer as a multi-hyphenate like no other. She is a singer, writer, performer, artistic director, a constant advocate for the arts, and she has also been described as a national treasure of Australia. Her CV is also more than illustrious. Robin has performed all over the world. She has written plays, devised cabarets, published numerous albums and books. She was artistic director of the Adelaide Festival of Arts and the Melbourne International Arts Festival. And she was also creative director and founder of Melbourne's the Light in Winter Festival, as well as the Centenary of Canberra. Once again, we are thrilled to have Robin Archer with us today. And Robin will be in obliging us with a short address this evening, after which we'll have a chat with her. There will also be time for Q&A. And at any time during the session, you may send in your questions in the comment section on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll try to address them during the Q&A segment. So without further ado, over to you, Robin. Thanks so much, Sue Ann. It's great to be here. Good evening, everybody. I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Bunwarang people of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So I'm in the city of Melbourne and we're in COVID lockdown again for the third time. Well, it is true that I've covered a lot of ground in my career, singing, performing, directing, writing, being an artistic director of festivals and events, and offering advice on arts and culture when invited to, and sometimes not invited, just when I think it might be useful or necessary. But I suppose I think of myself mainly as a singer, and for some years now, a singer in a kind of arcane sense, a sort of bringer of stories, in the way that itinerant minstrels in medieval times would go from village to village with stories in song. I started with singing at four years old. And for a long time, like most kids, I just wanted to be rich and famous. And I think that was probably still in my mind an ambition at high school when I was singing folk in folk clubs and appearing on local and national television. But at university, I studied English, Latin, politics and philosophy. And I think that as my critical faculty was honed and developed, there was a tension between the cliches of popular entertainment and the more nuanced behind the lines reading I was starting to get better at. For a couple of years, I had two names. I was teaching English full time under one name and singing full time under the other until 
I was invited quite out of the blue to sing the lead in The Seven Deadly Sins, an operetta written in 1933 by Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill. I sang with an orchestra for the very first time and the following year joined the same company for the Thrupany Opera and met an Englishman named John Willett, the man who would become my mentor for the rest of his life. He was about my father's age. As the principal editor and translator of the poetry of Bertolt Brecht, John introduced me to so much more of the repertoire of Brecht and his musical collaborators. I decided I could be more myself with this more difficult, more complex material. I could perhaps be both singer and teacher at the same time. And so I got rid of one of the names and became a professional freelance artist, which is what I've been ever since. Last year, like so many artists worldwide, all my performances were cancelled. I was locked down in Melbourne for 10 months, just as I am again right now, but able to do a lot of writing. Three of my long essays were published and I worked on developing two new concert programs which will premiere this year, one beginning in March, I hope, getting a little bit nervous about the current outbreak and state borders being closed, then we'll repeat that performance at the Adelaide Cabaret Festival in June and the second new show premieres in November in Brisbane. You can probably tell that I usually move around a lot, both in Australia and the world, and so COVID-19 has made a significant impact on my working life. Rehearsing has been very challenging because one of my musicians lives 35 kilometres away and we for a, were for a long time on a five kilometre radius limit, which we have again now, then 25 k's, and the other musician lives in Adelaide, my hometown, 800 kilometres away. I, in fact, should have been in Adelaide last week, driving that 800 k's from Melbourne to Adelaide, taking my accordionist George with me, so we three could rehearse together for four days and then drive back again, but alas, that hasn't been possible because of border closure and means that while I've been able to rehearse with each of them separately, the three of us haven't been in a room together for over a year and our first rescheduled concert comes up in four weeks' time. Eek! My vocal cords, those small, delicate little pieces of gristle, are like the muscles of any athlete. Having not used them in full voice for over a year, it's taking time for them to get back into shape, for me to have all my notes again and be able to sing non-stop for 90 minutes. That's one of the effects that COVID has had. It's almost 70 years since I had such a long break from singing in public and about 45 years since I've had such a long gap between getting on a plane to fly somewhere for work. The other, of course, is just not being able to get out in front of an audience. I recorded a few small pieces for the Adelaide Cabaret Festival last year in my bedroom on an iPhone. They wanted three by 60 second clips, they were okay, but it just doesn't do it for me, singing into the void. I'm very happy to sing at home with my partner in earshot or in the past with my mum and dad, but just alone into an iPhone doesn't really work for me. I've recorded 12 albums and my back catalogue is gradually being re-released this year digitally, but I don't think of myself as a recording artist. I love recording. We did a new album about 18 months ago and I especially loved recording at London's Abbey Road in the 1980s. Yep, same studio as the Beatles, about 20 years after they were there. But that was a live recording to two inch tape. So it had all the energy and adrenaline of live performance. And I think that's what I love most. It's the fear of walking on stage, the fear it takes to make sure you don't mess it up. Live performance is dangerous, and though I'm not the addictive type, there's certainly something very attractive about the adrenaline it produces and the high you get from doing a great show. I am slightly nervous about getting on a plane for the first time in over a year. There was an exposure incident at Melbourne Airport last week, and I'm being quite cautious, mask wearing, lots of antibacterial hand sanitation, lots of keeping my distance, no handshaking. These days, a bow or Indian namaste, and very rarely hugging, not even my relations. But I'm really looking forward to getting on stage and getting back to doing my job in front of a live audience, all of which will feel more comfortable once we've been vaccinated. But even then, given nothing's 100% certain or effective, I think we will continue to need to take care. The world has changed. 
I have this first upcoming opportunity in Hobart in Tasmania as part of a festival called 10 Days on the Island. I created this festival and was its first artistic director and this March it celebrates its 20th anniversary. It serves as a good introduction this evening to what festivals and other arts organisations are doing currently to emerge in a COVID normal world. But first I'll say a little bit about 10 Days on the Island because it was that festival that allowed me so much interaction with Singaporean artists. The premise of the festival, Tasmania's first international festival, was A, that it would be all around the island and to see it you'd need to travel all the beautiful places there and B, that the artists would only be from other islands throughout the world, hence many invitations to artists from Singapore. I had already worked in Adelaide and Melbourne with Ong King Sen and had been researching at the Singapore Festival when Go Ching Lee was its artistic director. I had also gotten to know Benson Pua through the organisation called ISPA, but soon I also became acquainted with the work of Ivan Heng, who is due to collaborate with Victorian Opera this year, uh, the Necessary Stage, the Tang Quartet, and was aware of all the cultural development which had started to occur in Singapore. My most recent visit to your city to talk to the new young teams at the Esplanade was just after the opening of your brilliant gallery and I so enjoyed seeing the first major exhibition, looking at the Singapore collection and of course eating at your fantastic restaurant. So 10 Days on the Island 2021 has done what most Australian international festivals, those who have been able to go ahead, have done. They have had to look mainly locally for content. As you know, uh, people are unable to fly out of or into Australia unless uh, under very circle, special circumstances or they are returning Australians and even for many of them it's quite difficult. So festivals have had to look mainly for local content and have included a clever blend of actual and virtual. I think this has been a terrific opportunity to revalue the work of local artists. There's always some degree of tension between the expending of large budgets for the import of international art and what is expended on local work. So this has been a great time for reversing the quotas. Given our discussion now, it's worth reminding that all the planning we do now has to be done, if one is wise, with a couple of things in mind. The Australian resilience scientist Brian Walker has always said we must embrace uncertainty and nothing could be truer at this time. The other thing I bear in mind all the time is from one of the poems of Bertolt Brecht, set to music by Paul Dessau, and I often use this uh, piece called The Song of the Flow of Things in my concert performance, and I'm including it in the current program. Brecht wrote, of all sure things, the surest is doubt. So we make very detailed plans, but they could all be overturned in a flash. In South Australia, late last year, the State Opera had managed to open its production of a, an old Australian opera at the summer of the 17th Doll. Opening night happened, the State shut down completely the next day, and the rest of the season was cancelled, even though the lockdown only lasted a few days. Just a couple of weeks ago, Western Australia became isolated as other states also closed their borders because of one case of the highly infectious UK strain of COVID-19. The lockdown in, in Western Australia was due to lift at 6pm on Friday with the sold out open air opening concert of the festival due to start at 7pm that night. But the artist was supposed to start rehearsal with the West Australian Symphony Orchestra on the Monday before and that was when the lockdown began. All events for the opening night were cancelled. I can only imagine the grief around that and not just about disappointing loyal audiences. A lockdown has the potential to wreak havoc on the financial position of any festival, even when this festival had been clever in constructing this year's program, almost entirely from local Perth-based companies, many in large open air venues, allowing social distancing and putting an emphasis on installations and exhibitions. It also included a watch at home streaming program of talks centered around writers and ideas. Although the sudden lockdown no doubt caused a great deal of angst, they had minimised the damage through this programming approach. Does it qualify as an international arts festival? Well, actually, who cares in this extreme moment? The money not spent on huge flights and freight costs, always significant at Australian festivals, has been put towards a number of local commissions, allowing local artists to be more ambitious 
and that's perfect in an imperfect moment. Sydney Festival did much the same with its Made in Australia label and even more live stream performance. And the Adelaide Festival, which opens in a few weeks time, has a blend. Like Perth and Sydney, there's a lot of work by Australian artists, but Adelaide has taken more risks in having lots of interstate work, which means riskier for those touring artists should a lockdown eventuate, the potential cost and inconvenience of quarantine. The international work in Adelaide is being live streamed into a large theatre where social distancing is possible. So very different from a usual Adelaide festival, normally awash with visiting international artists and audiences. This year, audiences will only see those international artists on screen. And following the cancellation of many Perth Fringe Festival events earlier this month, the Adelaide Fringe, the largest open access festival in the Southern Hemisphere, is meant to open February 19th, this Friday night. And right now, the South Australian border is closed to all Victorians. So also, there's a lot of tension there right now. Ten Days on the Island is due to open on March the 5th, and it has a program comprised almost entirely of Tasmanian artists. I am among the very few who will go there from the mainland, and that's because they're celebrating the 20th anniversary of that festival which I created. They have thus avoided most last-minute disappointments with border closures, as my musicians and I would be among the very few affected. Right now, all people from nearby Victoria, just a small ocean away, are not allowed into the island state. The festival has almost entirely avoided risk, but the program itself is imaginative and has offered terrific opportunities for local artists and ideas and an excellent organic blend of live and digital. So we're in a very fluid moment. We all want to move on, we want to make art, we want to share it with our audiences, old and new, young and old. We just have to do it in the knowledge that anything can change anytime without warning. And at the centre is the notion that human life is at risk. It's not that that hasn't happened before in our lifetimes. The AIDS epidemic grabbed many a young life and many from the arts world. You, here in Singapore, were about to launch a great Singapore festival when SARS broke out. This is a big one. It's not the first and it won't be the last. But that's not going to stop artistic expression. We just have to work hard at ensuring that the work of artists can still be shared, however we manage it, with an eager public. So, Suen, let's chat. Thank you, Robin, for that wonderfully elegant and compelling perspective. And I would say I completely echo your sentiments, and I agree that it is so important to be able to find the courage and creativity to view and to use this crisis as an opportunity for us all to dare to reimagine a world affected by COVID-19. And I would also say that while the, un the ongoing uncertainty of the pandemic has unsettled many of us, um, I'm sure it's also given us the opportunity to reflect and to reboot. And I say this especially in the context of our recent festival like tonight, which took place just three weeks ago from 22nd to the 31st of January. And it's amazing that every artwork, performance, and program in the festival, be it online or on site, you know, embodied the personal response of artists to the bigger question of what does it mean to work as an artist in this time of crisis? And so I wanted to start by posing this very same question to you, Robin. What has been in progress for you? And, you know, with all that you've observed in the past year, what is it in progress for festivals from the old normal to the new normal? Any thoughts? It's a, yeah, m many thoughts, of course. Um, I mean, I think starting, first of all, with your very central, uh, quintessential, existential question about what it means to be an artist at this time, because I'm quite sure that many artists like myself and many of my colleagues would observe the frontline workers during the pandemic each in our own countries, but in very extreme cases where, of course, we also all have colleagues and friends. So particularly I've been tracing, of course, the UK where I lived and worked for 10 years in London, uh, but also in France, in Germany, all across America, especially in New York. Um, we look at the frontline workers and it's one of those moments when I think we question ourselves as artists and say, can we really say that we are as essential to human life 
as these incredible people who risk their lives in trying to save lives. Um, it's a sort of question that I've put to myself for many, many years, thinking that, you know, I had the grades to be able to go and be a doctor if I wanted to. And had I become a doctor, then if I fixed a broken leg, I could see what I had fixed and could be pleased with myself. As an artist, I really don't have very much idea. There is a sense that the longer my career goes on, the more feedback I do get when it's not just the end of a show and the applause that you get or the good reviews or anything like that, but it's the people that will come up and talk about something, some performance of mine that they saw or a song that I wrote or a festival that I, I directed that was decades ago and people will say that really changed my life and it's only in those rare moments that I think okay yes I'm doing something I think what the various shutdowns the lockdowns of COVID has shown absolutely how vital the arts have been in people's lives I cannot imagine I mean it's all very well to say yes we could have got through all those things without music um, without theatre, without ballet, without dance, without movies, without screens, without visual art, swamping our screens. We had so much choice in screen. Um, it's all very well to say in theory you can do without, without it, but could you? And how important it is that the first instinct people had, whether it be choirs of doctors and nurses in hospitals or people on their balconies in Italy. What did they do? They sang. It's a primal thing to do with the human spirit. And I have argued for a long time that, in fact, artists are part of the essential services. I ask, I challenge people to say, try one day without the arts. Try going without visual imagery. Try going without music. Even if you don't choose to listen to it, it's coming at you out of your screens, out of retail stores, out of everywhere you go. And so we are using the products of arts all the time. And I think that has been very, very obvious um, during the pandemic and during lockdown. So I think in reaffirming our importance, I think that's that's very important. One does wish that, of course, governments are looking at that and taking notice of that because many, many artists in terms of uh, financial support uh, during the shutdowns, many artists have slipped through the cracks, Met particularly freelance artists um, who, who can't say, well, I was working for 12 months under employee conditions. So many freelance artists wouldn't be able to make a claim for the kind of support that maybe other workers did. I hope that what it will eventually teach governments is that the arts are incredibly important. Um, I suppose apart from that, you know, the other part of your question is really what is happening to festivals at the moment. And as I pointed out, most festivals, and I'm sure um, the bits that you've told me about your festival as well, I think everybody is adopting now the idea of, well, let's make sure that we've got um, some live elements, some face-to-face, -face, some with audiences in person, but we've also got a, a good quota of backup that's online, on screen, that can be socially distanced, etc. So at the moment, I think people are very wise to have a good blend of both and to be ready for any eventuality so that um, when uh, things really get stopped and suddenly audiences looking forward to something are suddenly away. There is still a way for them to enjoy it. It's not quite the same thing. Um, you know, we are all talking about screen online fatigue and the choices. I mean, it's been crazy during the pandemic because um, the amount of stuff that was on screen for online for us to choose from was like a thousand times more than we would ever go to in our real lives. Um, it's just, and, and you know, many people bewildered by choice. But I think what audiences are showing all over the world is that they're keen to get back. Some of them, especially the older age group, of course, are, are cautious because they're at greater risk. The vaccine will help a little bit. But I think festivals at the moment, at the moment only really have the choice to provide both kinds of delivery, both in the flesh, if you can, in the safest way possible, but also 
a good quota of things on screen, online, delivered safely. Uh, lot, interesting that, especially for you at a gallery, how important visual arts have become in all this because unlike having to get a, a theatre full of people together, you can, in a gallery, for instance, time visits, you can actually go in and allow a certain number of people to explore the collection and then move on and then bring uh, a, another set of people in. So I think all these things are coming into play and it just means that as festival directors and administrators, we all have to be much more agile than, than we were. Things aren't the same and we've got to prepare for all eventualities. The other thing that I think people have learned during the pandemic, um, many, many, as I said, you know, I put a, an iPhone on in the bedroom and little pictures of me singing little bits of songs, okay. I think what people have learned is that Screen is incredibly competitive. Um, there is so much great production from Bollywood and Hollywood, uh, you know, and, and Pine Tree Studios in Britain all the way. There are so many great artists working specifically for screen, even the greatest of the video clips that we see for contemporary music, for instance. I think what people have learned is that it's not good enough just to plonk a camera in front of what you were going to do live, just to put a camera on what would have been a theatre performance or a concert performance. You've got to start working with the experts in bringing things to the screen because otherwise you, the quality is just not good enough and it's just not competitive. People, if it doesn't have that, that shine and that quality, then you're probably not going to grab people's attention. So, again, one of the upsides is probably um, a new level of collaboration between performing artists and artists who are working in graphic design, in IT, in a whole lot of things about bringing things to the screen. And I think that's, that's a marvellous development. Indeed, and you're right to observe that the pandemic has certainly accelerated the volume of digital content online, and we have seen, you know, as you say, unprecedented developments and shifts towards digital programming and engagement in the arts. And according to one estimate, COVID-19 has telescoped five years of advances into the space of three months. And I think this mm -hmm. was an observation made of arts institutions and arts groups in terms of the rate of their digital adoption and engagement. And there have also been lots of discussions, especially in the past year, about the role of technology in festivals and exhibitions and in programs. And there aren't always ready solutions, especially in relation to more complex questions, you know, such as how we might engage audiences who are non-digital natives during the pandemic, or even address issues of digital fatigue that even audiences who may be digital natives may also be experiencing. So some may also argue that Digital engagement can be limiting with its lack of in-person connection to works existing in physical space. But yet there's also a general consensus that digital engagement is here to stay, even if we all agree that the digital can never replace the effective experiences that come from in-person encounters with art. So both from your personal experience as an artist as well as an arts audience, how has digital technology impacted the way art is created and experienced, um, and are there lessons you feel that you know could be learned in our approach to digital engagement? I think first of all, it's absolutely wise um, what you're uh, hinting at there. Really, the question that really comes is about equity and accessibility for all people. Um, this was discussed in, I've been a, a mentor for the uh, European Festivals Association Festival Academy for a long time and uh, they did online training sessions uh, at the end of last year. They were a little bit like this, um, started at 10 p.m. but ended at 1 pit, one a.m. for me. That's always an interesting experience, this, uh, this digital collaboration. We love it, but oh, it messes with the time sometimes. Um, in those, in those uh, sessions where we would have maybe 40 or so early career festival directors or managers really from all around the world and not just developed countries by any means, we had people from Palestine, from Armenia, I mean, war zones, uh, from uh, at various countries in Africa, etc., from Beirut, for instance. Um, and, and what was being expressed, of course, all the time with this 
group of young festival directors was that there is an assumption somehow that everybody can access digital. Well, even the participants in those sessions, which went, you know, for about six hours a day over three days, many of them dropped out, festival directors who really just did not have the internet capability that we in the developed world have. Um, I can't speak much for Australia. We're 67th in the world in terms of our digital connections, so we're lagging very badly, but clearly much, much better than some. So it's not good enough for us just to say we in developed countries can use digital and therefore everybody can. It's just not, it's just not the case. Um, what digital does, of course, is to, to many artists' surprise, having gone unnoticed by wide audiences for a long time, suddenly they have made the leap, they've gone online, they've started to deliver there and suddenly their audiences are in the hundreds of thousands, totally unexpected. So to, to, to some extent, for some artists, the access has increased massively, but we are still in that place where it may not be accessible to most people. And I think in that case, I suppose the two things that one could do is it is precisely for those people that you preserve whatever you can of live performance and give it live. But I also suppose that there's an ability uh, to do something like the Adelaide Festival is attempting, and that is although they're live streaming international, they are putting it on in a theatre at a ticket price. Now, it might be possible, for instance, given that outdoor venues are considered to be some of the safest planning things we could do because we can socially distance and the virus is not so infectious outdoors. Um, if we use our outdoor spaces, we could be uh, live streaming or screening uh, digital content onto a big screen hosted in an outdoor venue for people that don't actually have access or the tools to feel com as comfortable as a digital native would be. So I imagine that there are kind of ways in which we could we could nurture, we could host the digital for those who don't automatically gravitate towards the digital. We could host, we could teach at both ends of the scale for the elderly who may not be familiar with that. We could host digital programming for the very young. We can teach and they are marvellous learners and the uptake with very young children is enormous. So I think if we if we thought about digital content perhaps in, in a, in a counterintuitive way, try to think about it the way we would think about the way we deliver live performance. Um, I, for instance, have always been incredibly impressed by the Tang Quartet's uh, concerts in Singapore when they did away with the kind of arrogance of you've just got to walk on stage and do the program and walk off again, sort of basically saying to the audience, well, you should know what this is all about. The Tang Quartet was marvellous and it was attracting really younger audiences that would walk out the front and start talking about the program and the music that they were going to play and the way they went about it. In a, in a sense, I wonder if there's a sort of temporary bridge that we could all be assisting in actually taking the people less familiar with online work um, through a process of getting them more familiar, teaching them some of the skills. And at the same time, I suppose our social duty in a way is to ensure that increasingly everybody does get the opportunity. You know, it's like the, uh, it's like, a, you know, a computer in, a, in every child's a laptop or a, a, a tablet in every child's hands in Africa, a program that went on for some time before. Something like it's not just about giving people the tablet, um, the hardware, it's actually about coaxing them into ways in which their lives can be very, very much enjoyed in that way. It's interesting, the Australia Council here, all through the pandemic, was doing something called the Audience Outlook Monitor. And you can probably still find that on the Australia Council's website. And that was showing, even in June, for instance, audiences were saying, you know, we're desperate, we, we, and these are arts audiences, yeah, not the general public, but arts audiences saying, yes, we're desperate to get back and we're going to support the arts the minute it's safe to do so. On the other hand, we have been offered so many riches online that we think that that will also now take a greater part of our lives, not necessarily more than the live performance we can, but we're going to indulge more and more in screen presentations just because we've seen how marvellous it is. 
And, you know, I always think in the other bit of my mind, there is a marvellous film mark, my ear, and he was on the Australia Council with me. And he was raving about the progress in Silicon Valley. And this was some years ago, saying that the uh, hardware that you need for virtual reality is getting more sophisticated and cheaper every day. And that, in fact, we're at the point where the most sophisticated tool that you can have is not like being in the audience of a great concert or a play. It's actually like being on the stage with the musicians. So I can't help but think that in a world which, you know, let's see how our mobility goes over the next, you know, as I, as I said in my introduction, it's been a very long time since I've been prevented from getting on a plane to go to one of the many countries I visit and work in around the world. But we are stopped from doing that. I don't think as an Australian I'll be able to leave the country probably till next year at this point. Um, if that's the case, then surely there is going to be a greater uptake on virtual reality and the arts through virtual reality. And I think we just need to embrace that and embrace that without the fear that somehow it's going to destroy live performance. People will always be hungry for live performance. Artists will always want to see their audience in front of them. Even, even the most um, solitary of visual artists at some point want to see their opening night filled with people and talk to them and get their responses. So I think just as long as we keep that balance, continue to advance all the experiments that we're doing with screen technology, all the different ways that we can present the arts and make them accessible to more and more people. But I think keep the balance with that, that enormous joy of the live experience. I completely agree. And I think um, we did some pilots. Uh, there were some pilots in Singapore of live events um, as uh, the situation began to stabilise and, you know, venues started opening up. And I think clearly, you know, without a doubt, people were, you know, showing that they would very much prefer attending a live event than uh, to just, you know, have um, the option of just, you know, being on uh, attending it online. Um, and so to add to what you've just shared, I think one additional dimension that we had explored was also how art could be used to support the mental health of people in our community during COVID-19. And the connection between art and wellness, you know, it's an old one, but it's also emerged as especially vital, you know, during the pandemic. So during Circuit Breaker, we recognized that many people, especially healthcare workers, you know, were tirelessly working around the clock um, and they were experiencing a great deal of stress which was also exacerbated by the physical distancing, you know, and, and in some cases, isolation from your loved ones. And this led us to activate a new initiative known as the Care Collection, which is a selection of 30 works from the National Collection um, that were curated, you know, around themes such as courage, resilience, hope. But the intent was really to be able to use the art from the collection as content that could support professional art therapists and counsellors as uh, in their therapeutic practices um, for healthcare workers. So that was the first group that we started and we partnered uh, an art therapist from a local hospital and healthcare group uh, to, facilitate the, to facilitate the engagement sessions. And, you know, as the program was well received, we were then inspired to use the care collection to create another new program for the public, um, which was which went by the name of Slow Art. And essentially that program used principles of slow looking, mindfulness, and it was conducted over Zoom during the circuit breaker. Um, it was a 16 minute program online and it really provided, what we found that it really provided a meaningful platform for uh, self-reflection, social connection, art appreciation. And there were a number of other programs, uh, such as Art Plus Live, which is an online performance series um, that was led by artists, poets, musicians, uh, you know, in the context of the world that we're in. So some of these things, um, you know, we tried to offer them and make that available uh, online when the gallery was closed. And now that, you know, we have re reopened for about a year, um, we are also thinking of uh, new ways to bring some of these online connections uh, into the physical space. And I know, Robin, that you've also always looked for different ways to offer your festivals as a public platform for disparate, culturally rich communities to have a voice. And in engaging communities is the intention more to unearth those respected cultural expressions, which 
the local people hold dear and are eager to share with the rest of the country? Or, you know, has it been an issue in which uh, these voices have been marginalized, ignored or erased? And could you share with us who these communities are that you've engaged through your festivals and the process in which you've engaged them? Yes, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, when I was uh, invited to make a new festival for Federation Square, this uh, very, very big public piazza in, uh, in Melbourne, um, I had a long discussion with the CEO then, Kate Brennan, who was a very, very good uh, manager, uh, very good CEO. She had run the Adelaide Festival Centre for some years. Um, but she was somebody who also knew and cared about the arts and she also cared very much for community. So when we put that festival together, which eventually was called The Light in Winter, um, it, it was there were two curatorial principles really. Number one, they wanted a winter festival because Melbourne had a reputation of all the Australian cities, a reputation for being very cold and wet in winter and nobody would go through the square. It seemed to be just this empty plaza um, of, of cold and wind, etc. And so Kate wanted us to experiment with something that would bring audiences into the, into the square during winter. Uh, we thought that we would do it with uh, the new lighting installations. It was before lighting festivals had really taken off. We really preceded um, most of those in Australia. Um, we wanted to do something clever with lights. But at the same time, we wanted to involve the diverse communities of Melbourne because Melbourne is the most multicultural city in Australia and it has built its reputation of successive successful waves of immigration. And so I developed a program called The Gift of Light that sat inside the light in winter. And that was basically saying we were acknowledging the incredible gift of enlightenment, of riches, of openness, um, of tolerance that these successive communities had brought to Melbourne to make it the great cosmopolitan city that it is. Um, we began with only five uh, communities. Um, I know that they included Vietnamese, um, uh, Indian, Iranian, uh, I think, of course, First Nations, Australian, uh, local Indigenous artists. Um, and we made it intricate in the senses that we coupled them we, we went and spoke as one does with community work. We didn't impose things on them. We asked them first, well, would you want to be part of a festival in the middle of Melbourne? Because most of their community associations are really in the suburbs. They're not in the inner city of Melbourne. Why do you want to come into the middle anyway? Um, and they did. They all, and as we successfully built this festival over 10 years, um, we went from five communities to 30 different communities, highly diverse. Um, they wanted to be there because they said, we feel that showing our faces and showing our culture in the middle of the city um, makes us more obvious. We are, we are there, we are present in a way that we might not be present in other ways. And they all wanted to be there. But instead of just saying, well, bring your food and bring your traditional dance. We actually partnered them with a lighting, a local lighting artist. And so as the artists talked to them about the values of their community, about the way they went about their work, what was important to them, that artist worked with them to create a lighting installation to be put into the square that represented um, what they believed in, what was what was their core meeting. So I know that um, the Iranian community, uh, the artist lit one entire wall, transparent wall of Federation Square in green and there were the seven stages of heaven. So rows of candles were placed along the seven beams leading upwards and there was this entire green wall. And then there were other programs of performance that were specific to those communities. I think... The one that um, I remember most was um, a, a woman from Tuvalu, Kiribati. And she said to us, uh, she was part of the Pacific communities that were represented eventually in the festival. And she said that she wanted to proclaim herself as an elder in exile 
because with the rising levels of the ocean, soon Tuvalu and Kiribati would be completely submerged and her children would have no land to return to. And so she got permission from the elders in Tuvalu Kiribati to do something to proclaim herself as an elder in exile. What she did was lay in the square with her family around her while a traditional artist made a tattoo down her back um, in the traditional hammering method and it was called uh, down the backbone and she for several hours lay under a shelter with a traditional tattooing artist inking her back and at the end she stood up and an elder from the First Nations uh, Indigenous community of Melbourne came and took her to the fire the campfire which we kept alight throughout the month of June and around which we had Indigenous storytelling, performance, etc., etc. And she was able to proclaim herself as an elder in exile. Now, there was somebody who thought in the middle of a highly developed urban city, I can actually say something that's very personal and very political and it's of great importance to me. And so we had sort of yes intentionally but never knowing quite what would come about we had created a very very valuable platform for this person to make her statement um and so i think it went on like that there were some high school girls who were poets who were rap poets who um were muslim uh they had had real problems with uh, wearing the hijab, they were told that the hijab had to be in the school colours and they were making this poetry saying, hey, but other girls can have their care, hair pink or purple or whatever, why can't we have the colours that we want to wear in our headscarves? They did a whole performance for us, poetry performance, and this was to the general public. So it was, it was sort of we were able to offer a platform that could be quite challenging but brave and in a sense was nurtured. Um, it was a safe platform. We were creating safe spaces for people to make very important, often very personal statements. Um, another one that happened was, um, I think it might have been the Afghan men who said that when they came uh, into Australia, their wives were introduced to Australian communities much more because they would take the kids to school and they would have to interact with the schools. But the men got jobs as taxi drivers and felt very isolated. And so these men constructed a tent in the middle of Federation Square and they sat under it and you could go and sit with them and they would read you a letter that they were writing to their friends at home about all the things that were, were challenging them in life in Australia. So incredibly brave, really fantastic projects um, that were, were big statements but very intimate but in the middle of this absolutely massive square which normally during winter would have been empty and suddenly the numbers through the square throughout the month of June increased enormously. So this kind of program became very satisfying. We not only were able to commission one of the greatest light installations um, ever, Solar Equation by Rafael Lozano Hemmer, which raised the sun an enormous the largest spherical helium-filled balloon in the world filled Federation Square and onto it were projected via NASA equations the movement on the sun's surface. And we also, at that time, not everybody had uh, iPhones, so we were able to let, let alone hire out uh, tablets in which people could play with the equations and put their own designs on the sun. So we had these really kind of very expensive very successful, huge artistic-led installations together with these small communities. And all that takes is a bit of courage. All it takes is to be able to persuade people that you can put, that those things are not mutually exclusive. You can aim for the stars, in our case, quite literally, aim for the stars with artistic excellence, but also at the same time have a mind to, to allow alternative voices to express themselves. Indeed. And I think as you were describing, um, you know, the art. Uh, and the artists, you know, who were involved in festivals. I think two words come to mind. One, you mentioned courage. And of course, resilience is the other one. And as we know, 2020 has been 
or had been an exceptionally challenging year, we've also witnessed um, tremendous resilience of artists. Um, and earlier you were talking about travel, um, you know, being disrupted by the pandemic. And I think many artists uh, we've come across, you know, found ways to collaborate, be it virtually or, you know, alternatively across space and time and created work that was both moving and reflective of the times that we find ourselves in. And although the creative process um, and the eventual presentation of many works, um, such as those in the recent edition of the Light Tonight Festival, involve the use of technology, I find that it is always ultimately the humanistic qualities in a work you know, that we find a connection with and are transformed by. And one work um, that I recall um, in the recent festival was a work, a digital work um, titled Rerouting by the artist, uh, Singapore artist Joanne Ho, where she used machine learning as a method of art making to generate new images that had never existed before, but somehow appeared familiar to us. And what she had created, in fact, was a work that uses technology to explore and express what it means to be human, as the work is a reminder of the fragility of how we remember things and the fallibility of human memory. And in this case, the work alludes uh, to her personal experience of rerouting herself uh, back into Singapore, her desire to rebuild her connection with people, places, in retracing her memories, having lived abroad for many years and now returning to a place that is both familiar and new at the same time. And in a way, festivals have the agility to respond to unique situations such as the one uh, that we find ourselves in now. Given that there are a number of challenges that the pandemic has forced us to confront and, you know, we are also collectively finding answers to these ever-evolving challenges, do you have any thoughts about how festivals can use this particular moment for the future in terms of responding to the changing interests and needs of society? And more importantly, how can festivals build resilience? Gee, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the first, th the first thing to say in terms of, um, in terms of resilience, I think, is um, there's, a, there's a scientist that I follow a lot, Brian Walker, um, whom I quoted uh, talking in my, in my introduction. Um, Brian is constantly talking about not sustainability because sometimes people think of sustainability as just keeping something in a fixed position, only sustaining it. And he is constantly talking about resilience as um, not, to, uh, not to stop disturbance because if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we can't, that there will always be disturbances. But how to absorb disturbance without wholly changing your nature and function. So you can either be not resilient and um, an unexpected disturbance will knock you flat and then you've got to build from ground zero up or you can be agile and flexible. And when a disturbance comes, even though you have no idea what it will be, and I mean, I suppose the COVID-19 uh, virus is something that scientists had been predicting uh, for a long time, and they are still predicting, well, this won't be the last and it's not gonna be the biggest, etc. But everybody was shocked by it and people were still unprepared for it. And there was still this, there is still this instinct which I would say holds true for festivals as much as it holds true for everything, is that we have ample evidence that um, buildings don't last forever. Big walls eventually crumble, cities crumble, civilizations crumble, economic systems fall away and are broken. Nothing will resist disturbance forever. And Yet we behave in our, in our own lives, we behave in a way that thinks that somehow we can stop disturbance. You know, the, the one fundamental thing, the breath thing, of all sure things, the surest is doubt. The one absolutely sure thing we know about is change. And so I think if anything, if a festival decided this is what this festival is and this is what it will always be, you're already asking for trouble. You've really got to constantly be reinventing yourself according to the times and the conditions and the needs. Um, Brian Walker has pointed out that 
there have been many times in the last, let's say, 100 years um, that we could have changed society for the better. Um, World War One, World War Two, the Great Depression, the stock exchange crash in the United States, the Berlin Wall, the, the ending of the Berlin Wall, uh, the GFC, um, now, of course, the pandemic. Um, what is important is what you do in the wake of that. Um, crises are the very, very best moment for change. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of optimism if we look back that what happened after all those big crises is that people uh, went in and tried to restore exactly the same thing that had been before. Um, it's a time now when we could really, really change things. Uh, Naomi Klein has written about this in her, her book, Shock Doctrine, which she wrote after Hurricane Katrina. Um, the pandemic has shown that by and large in all countries, uh, people who are economically better off and better educated are surviving the pandemic much more than people who are in lower economic classes, who are in poverty. These are the people who are really having a very, very bad time with the pandemic. What does that tell us? Does that not tell us that what we should do is try and level out those gaps in society, try and make sure that those in poverty are not in poverty, that we start to have a more equal distribution of wealth and privilege. It's, it's hitting us in the face that if it's, a, if it's a hurricane, if it's a tsunami, if it's an earthquake, if it's a pandemic, um, those that suffer most are those are at the bottom rung of the economic order in any society. And so we should be using these moments, and I think many artists will. I think that is often the response of artists. What's been really interesting for me, it sounds like the project that you talked about did exactly that. It's about how do you reroute yourself after these moments? How do people get back to what they really want to be or need to be or can be in a new world? Um, one of the questions I've been asking recently is, um, Australia is very fortunate in its weather. It's it's a lot of sun. We get a lot of outdoors. We can do outdoor auditoria really well, and that's one of the safest ways to program at the moment. Um, but does that mean that there will be a preference for, let's say, fun in the sun? Is it possible to do the really nuanced and challenging work, the complex, difficult work that we know and love inside smaller theatres, with smaller dance, with uh, smaller visual art installation projects. Can that happen outside on the large scale? And if not, if there is a propensity at the moment for big outdoor spectacular, few, we didn't die during the pandemic, so let's all celebrate and have fun. If that becomes the dominant theme of the next year or so, Will we be able to get the resources we need to get back to funding the difficult art, which I would claim we also need? I think that's going to be one of the challenges of the future and may well be one of the challenges for those artists who tend to work in that difficult world. I mean, the arts, as I say often, the arts are the safest place for a dangerous conversation. We can take on the most difficult subjects in the world and we can talk about them in a way that also has our audiences gasping with awe at how beautiful it is, even when what we're talking about is actually sometimes very ugly and very difficult. Um, are, is the next year going to grow a prejudice against that kind of work in favour of the happier few, we're all over it, um, let's have a good time, what a great relief. I think that could be one of the challenging questions um, and, and that goes directly to your point about how we can use festivals to illustrate the challenges that are, 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 are in our society. And it is indeed the perfect time to be able to do those things, providing people are still willing to back that kind of art. Absolutely. I think one way we try to build resilience into um, our festivals is really also through partnerships, mentorships, and also allowing for new participatory models of festival making to emerge and to, to take root. And one example I can share is um, 
we recently started a youth collective initiative because youths have traditionally been an underrepresented segment in many museums um, and youths in Singapore, especially time staffed because of heavy school related commitments. And so with the intention of wanting to better understand how to bring youth voices and creativity into our gallery spaces and programs, we undertook research and stakeholder consultation across various sectors in Singapore and internationally uh, to identify the gaps in youth engagement in museums today. And what we found was that most museum programs on youth engagement tended to be school-based and participation tended to be more passive, where youths were treated more as consumers of content rather than active co-creators. And while there were a small handful of museum programs in which youths took on more active roles, I think these pertain uh, more towards guiding programs where youths were trained as docents. Um, we noted also that there were opportunities for youths to take on more active roles as leaders or co-creators in the performing arts, in some of the performing arts organizations um, locally, but there were few to none in visual arts organizations when we started the program. And because we believe that there's value in looking to young people for leadership with regards to issues that matter to them, about a year ago, we formed a youth committee through an open call where a group of youths uh, between 17 and 25 years were given the opportunity to uncover their potential and to develop skills and knowledge that would enable them to become stronger advocates for youth engagement in the gallery. And the response is quite overwhelming. Uh, we had 20 youths uh, selected from a pool of 200 applicants. And having journeyed with them for about a year, these youths recently organized a takeover at the festival with a range of thought-provoking programs that were organized for youths, by youths. And even though the, the planning was rather protracted, given the evolving situation of the pandemic, you know, the outcome really did su surpass all of their expectations as well as ours. And I think given the success of this, um, you know, unique community uh, engagement initiative, we are now planning for a second batch of youths to join the program. And Robin, I know that amongst your many roles is that of mentor to a number of, you know, young artists, um, artistic directors, um, and prof arts professionals in Australia as well as abroad and through your involvement in the European Festivals Association Atelier. So what advice would you give your mentees that can help prepare them in meeting the challenges and opportunities awaiting the future of festivals? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things that I'll mention too, uh, when during the centenary of Canberra, um, when I got there, I, I mainly wanted to use that opportunity to change people's perspectives about our national capital because I've had a reputation that it's only politicians and public service workers and it's boring and there aren't any young people there. Um, and I really wanted to change perceptions uh, of that. And so my first thing was to go to, I found a couple of young people that had had some little bit of festival experience in another one of the Australian cities and said to them, okay, I wouldn't have a clue at this time what, you know, a 20-year-old or an 18-year-old really wants in terms of the arts. Um, here's a budget. Uh, get a mob of kids around you and really do a festival for us. And they produced something called You Are Here um, and it went for about six or seven years and fantastic things, uh, very close to the ground, really great programs. Um, after, I think, two years, the originators had already had a succession plan uh, so that younger ones could even take over from then. It was so beautiful. It was so agile and excellent. M many of those people have gone on to have terrific um, artistic trajectories after that. So I think when you're, when you're planning around something for young people, uh, the first instinct was um, teachers wanted to tell me what young people wanted. And I said, no, I don't want that. I actually want young people to tell me what young people want. So we had a, a primary school group and we had a, um, a, a teenage group, a teenage to mid-20s group, just to see and the ideas. We, we didn't get all of the ideas done, but they were fantastic ideas. And it just allowed us to be much more authentic, not to impose our idea of what young people might like. Um, there are any number of things that I say to younger people in professions in the arts. Um, one of them is, you know, I, I do suggest that they take every opportunity that they're offered. Um, I've often proudly said that I have no qualifications for anything that I do. Um, I guess my 
My degree in English language and literature gave me a facility with words, being able to some extent to write, but mainly to develop a critical faculty. It gave me great skills in time management, etc. So I'm, I'm able to fit a lot into my working life. Um, so um, I'd say even if you, if you are offered an opportunity or you pursue an opportunity and in the back of your mind you say, I'm not qualified to do this, my advice is if you can get the opportunity, take the opportunity and learn on the job. That's the best thing you can do. Um, I'm often saying to people, the best thing you can ever do in any job is put your head down and do that job absolutely to the best of your ability, whatever it is, because you can be pretty sure that other people are watching you working. And if they like what they see, then they will invite you to do something else. And that's the, that's the greatest trajectory for any artist. For me, you know, last week, this concert that I'm preparing for Tasmania and then Adelaide, I get a call from a colleague from a terrific venue in Melbourne saying, would you like to bring that concert to us? And I'm going, yes. And right during the pandemic, the Queensland Theatre Company got in touch and said, would you like to do this project that we talked about several years ago and we never did it? Bingo, this being invited to do something, even, I, I mean, I think you need a certain amount of self-awareness um, in saying, I, you know, if somebody said, uh, would you like to perform this brain surgery, I would very easily be able to say, sorry, I can't do that. Or, you know, would you like to play Serena Williams in the Australian Open final? No, clearly I can't. But I think within the bounds of possibility, it is a great thing and a great thing for one's confidence to be able to go into something and just say, Yes, I, I think I think I can take the next step. I think I can do it. And until somebody invites you, the best you can do is do absolutely the best you can at the job you're doing. And and one thing will follow the other. One good good piece of work will follow the other. So first of all, that in terms of festival making, um, I talk a lot about awareness. Just saying, and principally. We never know what we don't know. Um, and the journey for all of us in life and in art is simply that when we become aware, we must always constantly be curious and try to become aware of those things that we probably don't know. Still, just like a crisis or a pandemic, just like any of those major crises that happen in our world, the seismic shifts, if you like, you will be surprised at what you don't know. Something will come up and hit you that you just didn't see coming, that you had, you were ignorant of, that you should, you might, perhaps you should have known, but you just never come across it, and it presents a real challenge. Somebody during one of the atelier sessions at the end of last year said, "If you make a mistake, don't be afraid to face up again. Don't let." fear of doing the wrong thing stop you from doing what you want to do but you are going to have mistakes all along the way and simply again develop that flexibility you, you, you can't ever let oh I'm going to make a mistake so I won't do that I won't go there I won't dare that I won't take that risk um, I think in the arts we must constantly be taking risks we as festival directors or administrators must be as brave as any artist who works onto the stage um, who is constantly taking a risk. You know, I, I, I used to use the example of when I walk onto the stage, particularly, for instance, in a one-woman show, of which I've done quite a few, I am blinded by the lights. I don't have anything around me to protect myself in the normal way that I would if I were walking down the street um, or in a venue somewhere where I can see what's coming at me. I'm blinded by the lights and I hear the tiniest sound at the back and I'm aware of it. I hear somebody cough in the audience and I'm aware of it. My senses are absolutely alive because I'm actually at risk. And you don't have to be a circus performer. Um, you don't have to be the lady being cut in half by the sword or having the knives thrown at her to be at risk when you're on a stage you know you're also at risk of making a mistake and making a fool of yourself and that's one of the great drivers of adrenaline in a performing artist i just better get it right here um i think that we can't you know if 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 performing artists ever allowed that to stop them we wouldn't have any performing arts but similarly in presenting festivals we do have to take considered risks all the time and when and and learn on the job 
constantly learn on the job is, is part of the advice that I would always give. Be flexible, be agile, learn on the job and be aware, just be aware, particularly be aware as everything that you possibly can about the conditions and the context of the work you're doing. Um, but also be aware that something will spring up that you don't know about. And then you've really got to be very agile in the way you deal with it and the way you learn from that. They're certainly some of the things that I talk to younger artistic directors about. That's wonderful advice. And I think you spoke about risk and I wanted to also then segue into, um, a, you know, speaking about valuing the civic because that's also very much, you know, part of uh, the core of festivals, right? And as we all know, I think a festival entails a series of complex negotiations and actions within the wider economic, social and cultural context. And I wanted at this point to also point to a work uh, from the festival, which is um, by an artist called Nathan Yong. And here you uh, you see a sculpture which he's created. Uh, it's called There in the Middleness. And the work is interesting because it is an invitation to engage with art on a number of levels. Um, first, I mean, you know, looking at the site, the work is located in an open field, which we call the padang, which uh, is a Malay term which means field. And this padang or open field is located within the downca- downtown core of the city centre in an arts and cultural precinct known as the Civic District. And here you see the gallery flanking one side of the padang, which is not dissimilar from Federation Square in Melbourne, which you talk about, mm-hmm. um, which is you know the site of your festival, the light in winter. And Similar to that, the Padang is also anchored by a number of arts and cultural institutions, you know, which surround it. And historically, since the 1880s, the Padang has been a gathering point for many people in Singapore from all walks of life. It's also where people congregated around key events in Singapore's history. And unlike before, the Padang today is a privately operated space. And during the festival, the artist, through his social sculpture, sought to return the Padang to its function as a civic space for people. And here you see, you know, its circular form of this um, installation does draw inspiration from the ancient uh, Greek symbol of the Ouroboros to symbolize hope and healing. And since we aren't able to get a close-up of the work, um, I'll just briefly describe the details of the work. So from afar, the sculpture resembles a continuous circle. But upon close looking, you'll notice that it uh, actually comprises 125 individual blocks. And on each of these blocks, um, is etched, uh, a word is etched on it, contributed by an individual uh, reflecting on the question, what values will be important to us in a post-pandemic world in light of all uh, that we've experienced this past year? So this notion of the civic was very much embedded also in your Light in Winter Festival in Federation Square, which is a public space that's located um, at the heart of Melbourne and also similarly anchored by a number of cultural institutions. And, um, you know, when we were speaking earlier, I was also um, interested to find out, you know, more recently, the Federation Square was really uh, successfully listed in the Victorian Heritage Register uh, last year, and there was a lot of strong public support in retaining uh, Fed Square as an inclusive place for people in the community at large, as opposed to it um, being taken over for commercial purposes. So as someone who knows and works in that space intimately, having staged many of your festivals there, um, do you think the square's cultural and civic objectives um, has shifted in, you know, since the first edition of your Light in Winter Festival? And how might a public space um, like the Fat Square and other similar, similar spaces to it achieve the right balance between being financially viable while continuing to be a space that is inclusive to diverse communities through arts and culture? And also, how can the square's heritage and value as a public, civic, and cultural space be upheld as it continues to evolve with contemporary needs. So just wanted to know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, Federation Square, my, my office at the Melbourne Festival looked over Federation Square and so I saw it being constructed from the ground up. I could tell when there was some dispute because all the lights went off and I could tell when they were hurrying up the work again because all they were working 24 hours a day. And it wasn't ready for my first Melbourne festival, um, but we did something um, outside the barriers 
um, we did a, a beautiful program called Not at Home, K-N-O-T at Home, which was all about homeless young people in Melbourne. And they had a bed just outside the barriers at the very beginning of Federation Square. And um, uh, people occupied the bed for the entire 17 days of the festival, 24 hours a day. So I got in the bed for a while. Celebrities, stars, kids, people, everyone, we all just occupied the bed and young people, came, young homeless people came and did interviews with us about homelessness. Um, and then uh, they put all that together in a show, in a theatre, uh, for at the end of the festival. It was a terrific project and it really was very interesting about just getting people to recognise that in such a well-endowed city like Melbourne with this fantastic new space opened up as a public space that there were homeless people in Melbourne at that time. Um, and um, that was for the Melbourne Festival rather than from the light in winter. What was interesting is that, as with all new buildings, there was uh, incredible difference in taste about whether people liked Federation Square or whether they didn't like it, whether they found it aesthetically pleasing or ugly. Lots and lots of dispute, as there almost always is with all new buildings. But when the barriers came down, the people of Melbourne flooded that square. It instantly became occupied. The people really spoke and they said, this is our public gathering place. We haven't really had one of these before. I mean, people protest on the steps of Parliament House or they would walk through the city, but suddenly this became the place and it became the place and has been the place ever since. Whether in large-scale celebration inside the city or in protest, or, for instance, there is a graduation ceremony for the uh, RMIT University, which is just down the main street from Federation Square. So the students parade up the main street and then they go to Federation Square and have all their speeches and their gatherings there. <coughs> Pardon me. So from the very start, the people claimed that space when our ex-Prime Minister, our former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, made the great apology to the First Nations people of this country. People gathered in the square to watch that statement. People hugged each other and wept and cried as this long-awaited apology was made. And we did it all together in the square. At the same time, when there is a massive um, international soccer event, for instance, and Australia is playing, uh, it could be the middle of the night, it's being played in Europe, uh, 7,000 people would gather in that square. So its civic use was obvious and plain and that's exactly what the square was there for, surrounded by art at the heart of the cultural precinct in Melbourne, but it was the people who claimed that space. Very, very important. I think what's interesting at the moment, and, and it's, it's a bit the same as your, your, the, uh, the, the Padang that you're talking about here where the gallery sits, I've been involved in a project in Canberra, again, the national capital, I'm involved in at the moment, and that is the revitalisation of something which is called Civic Square um, and the assembly of the uh, parliament of the Australian Capital Territory where Canberra sits is on that square, but opposite that is the local museum and at the other corner of that is the, the theatre. And there's a lot of ideas about refurbishing that square. And it's been very, very pleasing to hear the board of uh, the authority that's doing this transformation talk about the value of civic life at the same time as it being a cultural precinct, they also want to maintain the civic presence. And, you know, sometimes there are arguments saying, well, because the assembly is there and the politicians are there, the security is massive and there are security guards all the time and that kind of diminishes a free and open space. I think people are very wise to make the point that art exists in the same society as politics. Um, they're not, they, they are part of the same society and they very, very often interact. Just the very fact that governments um, take public money and give it to the arts to make their work is already part and parcel of a very intimate relationship. So why necessarily would you need to separate these functions? Maybe there's something you can do to make it very, very important. And people talked a little bit about um, the library, there is, a, there is the library is set back in that square, but it's got a sort of more recent architectural intervention, which is not very interesting. But what they were saying is that the library 
and the presence of education, the presence of words, of opinions, of thinking through things does have a very deserved presence inside a cultural precinct. So the value of thinking, the value of ideas, the value of the kinds of things that books and the other things that contemporary libraries give you are very, very important to that space. So I would say that there is nothing, there is nothing particularly antithetical about it, except when, again, so many of the things we talk about are about balance. And again, the, the problem will come if one suffers because of the other. If you're going to have a big public space and it has traditionally been used for public gatherings and speeches and rallies and all kinds of things, it would seem to me to be a shame if that is closed off. Um, in some ways, the art that you have is diminished if you silence the public voice. Art will always be stronger. Entertainment and having a good time will, will still be stronger in my mind if you don't say we can only be happy if we forget the more difficult bits of life, the, the politics, the difficult issues that face us. Um, it's, it's, that comes, I suppose, from a very personal opinion to me. I, um, I am not the kind of person who goes to the arts in order to wash away my troubles. In fact, I get very annoyed if something that I go to see is just saccharine, happy ending. I don't mind big finishes. I don't mind passionate enjoyment. But if something is simply brushing under the, you know, let's go out to the arts to forget all our troubles, even after a pandemic, it seems a little unreal to me. I think the arts are so clever in the sense that they can deal with really difficult subjects in a very, very beautiful and awe inspiring way. And it seems to me that there is nothing antithetical between civic life and and the arts. And I actually think that they can fit together in really fantastic ways. I feel that art is stronger if it takes seriously its social and ethical responsibilities. And I think audiences respond to that. I'm always amazed in my own recitals, for instance, how willing my audiences are to have almost what's a, a lecture demonstration. Yes, I'm singing with my musicians, I'm covering you know, 20 or 25 songs in a show, but they don't seem to mind if I tell them a bit about the song. Um, a little bit like I was talking about the tang quartet, being able to introduce the work. Um, we're not going to pretend that we all have the same knowledge. Here's when it was written. Here's why it was written. This is what it meant at the time. Um, put a context to those songs. And that's almost like a, a bit of history about the songs that I sing together with the, the, the other things that tie the program together, fast, slow, funny, silly, dramatic, etc., etc. It's all part of that curatorial process. It seems to me that art generally and even entertainment is stronger. If I look at um, the musicals, the musical theatre that my dad used to listen to and sing, he was a singer, um, and the records that he played in our house, the strongest of the great Broadway musicals um, were really those in, in, in the past, I'm saying in the, in the 40s and the 50s, were ones that actually had some level of social context in them. So um, Oklahoma was all about the battle between the farmers and the cowhands. Um, West Side Story was about gangs and interracial violence. Porgy and Bess, I mean, all those, in My Fair Lady was about class from Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. You know, even the greatest entertainments, musical theatre, bright and sparkly, but the strongest of all were the ones that didn't ignore the tensions in life and some of the more difficult subjects. So it seems to me that we can blend civic presence with arts presence and with commercial presence um, it, it, you know, I know one of the one of the debates at Federation Square was should they let Apple have a store? Uh, Melbourne City still doesn't have a big Apple store in the middle of the city, and people kind of were saying, oh, we, we can't have Apple in the middle of Federation Square. Well, I think that's cultural. Um, I think to see you know four year olds 
playing with tablets and doing creative things. I think that's part of culture. So I think a certain level of commerciality, just as I'm sure your gallery, I know your gallery has a retail shop um, and a restaurant. I don't think there's anything particularly incompatible with certain levels of commerciality as well as the most intricate and complex of arts, as well as an understanding of civic life and allowing that civic participation. I think they can all do very harmoniously and I think it's very good for a society if they're encouraged to do so. Indeed, I think balance is what we always seek. I think that's also what we try um, to expect from our festivals, to be able to open up, you know, and I suppose bring to bear uh, some uh, responses to th these uh, uh, these concerns and, and some of these debates and issues. And I guess to return to um, the topic, you know, in all of these discussions about, you know, adapting to a world under the shadow of COVID-19, um, what are your thoughts in terms of the tasks and challenges um, that are already there way before the pandemic that we must not forget to address? And this is a question that came in from a member of the public. And, uh, you know, Robin, you know, any thoughts about that? Um, I suppose the perpetual uh, the perpetual challenge uh, is um, equity. I think we've spoken about that already. The fact that um, no one festival can be all things to all people. Um, there is always there is always a chance. I suppose that um, if you open absolute, if you try to open access to absolutely everybody in every demographic. Um, you may fail to please anyone. Uh, if You know, there's always that question. People get very scared about, oh, if it's all about the community and you're serving community, the art won't be good enough. Well, I think the light in winter proved that we could make a perfect blend of those things. And there are these days no absence of artists who really do want to interact immediately with ordinary people, not necessarily with an arts audience. They actually feel better if they are not exactly preaching to the educated and, and the converted, but if their work is actually enlightening something about real life or about real problems. So I think festivals, we have to be very careful. We've got to be... They've got to be good business models in the end because if you keep failing and you fail to reach the audience you intended or you fail financially, then you won't survive. That's just part of the... It's like any artist. If you fail to find any audience whatsoever or you fail to find funding um, and you can no longer feed yourself or your family or pay your rent, then you're probably going to have to do something different. That's just a fact of life. And we know that there are many, many artists throughout history who, and, and it's particularly so today, many artists who understand that being a starving artist in the garret is not what you have to do. You could have a job in a related industry and still pursue your art at a very high level, not just as a hobby. So I think we have to look very carefully at those. I think that's still a challenge. How do we ensure that the festivals and the events that we create do look very carefully and maybe an institution like the gallery um, make sure that it it does touch over a year it does touch almost everybody in the community but maybe in segmented pieces this is for this audience this is for a wider audience this is for a very specific audience i think that kind of programming for a venue or for a gallery i think that it, it's precisely what the esplanade theaters on the bay have tried to do i know from the very start try to reach everybody and make sure that everybody participates in some way i think that 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 idea of equity and access is a constant challenge, especially in that balance of creating excellent work, brilliant, inspiring work, as well as being accessible. I think that was one of the challenges pre-pandemic. And the one that exists now, we are still at the very beginning of this. We really don't know at the moment which arts companies, which institutions, which festivals will actually be able to survive what's going on, because the financial damage is enormous. Governments probably won't be able to continue to bail out arts organisations forever. And while you're sitting in theatres that seat 2,000 but you can only sell 1,000 tickets or 75%, new business models have to be created. So there is a whole set of, you know, very interesting that the kind of contracts I'm receiving for my work at the moment all now have these intricate COVID clauses which say 
basically it doesn't matter how much you rehearsed if there's a quarantine we won't be able to afford to quarantine and feed you for two weeks so it's off it's not going to happen we're, we're all working with a new kind of liability um, which was always there in terms of rain for an outdoor festival um, bushfires closed down many of the theaters in canberra last year um, you know there are all sorts of things that can shut us down i think what the pandemic has done has actually taught us that we simply must be as flexible as we're possible and you know part of the part of considering building new theatres and new venues. How do you make them as flexible as possible? How do you make them still working institutions that if suddenly you're cut to nothing or 50%, that you don't actually run into bankruptcy at the same time? It's a very delicate balance at the moment. And I think a lot of people are thinking about precisely that. Indeed. And I think that's a wonderful um, thought, you know, for us to ponder on and to reflect. And I want to take the, the opportunity to thank you, Robin, for giving us so much to think about as we continue to find our way through this pandemic while searching for ways to gather and to come together. I hope to be able to continue our conversation in person one day. And, you know, to all of you tuning in, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to join us uh, this evening. I hope you have also enjoyed this talk and found it uh, to be meaningful. And as we close, I would also like to invite you to check out other programs at novelwaysofbeing.sg, Robin, as well as Robin's website at robinarcher.com. And last but not least, do scan the QR code coming up on screen to leave us your feedback. So on this note, I wish you all um, a good night and good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Bye-bye. Thank you, Robin. <laughs>